It's thing with the <laughs> library starts now, although I don't think it's okay. happening. Okay, hello everybody who's joining us through Zoom and in person. My name is Samantha Bonwick and I am the Outreach Coordinator here at the library and I am more than happy to announce the first session of our 2024 Winter Speaker. Oh, I'm not thinking I'm just sitting on and so just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, please, if you are watching online, please mute yourself during the presentation. After the presentation, there will be time for some Q&A moments. So just hold on to your questions until Steve is done his presentation. Um, and you're welcome to turn on your video, but you don't have it. So that's your choice. Before I turn it on, over to Steve, I'm just going to say a land acknowledgement, and then I'll turn it over to the experts for tonight. Pinch Creek, sorry, Pinch Creek and District Municipal Library is located on the Blackfoot people. We pay respect to those to the Blackfoot community of the past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage beliefs in relationship to the land. This land is also home to the Native Nation of Alberta Region 3. And without further ado, I'll leave it to Steve from Adaptable. Thanks for that introduction, Sam, and uh, thanks to the library for having me out to speak today. Thanks also to all of you who have joined to watch the talk. It's much appreciated. So, as Sam mentioned, one moment. I've just got to share screen with you guys. There we go. That should be working now.
Okay, so I'm Steve Foley. I'm the co-founder, executive director, and the lead guide for Adaptable Outdoor Recreation Society, or as we're more commonly known, Adaptable Outdoors. So just to give you a, a little bit of background about me and how I got into this and how I ended up here in uh, Southern Alberta. So I first came to Canada as part of an internship to work with the government of Alberta uh, in grizzly bear research and wolverine research. I then worked, uh, volunteered as a bear monitor for the government of Alberta while I was waiting for my work visa. And when I got my work visa, I got hired on as a conservation officer in Peter Lougheed Provincial Park. Um, there I got experience uh, acting as a first responder and also got a lot of training in mountain safety, uh, rope rescue, heli sling rescue. And uh, the picture in the corner there is me pretending to be a bear mauling victim for wildlife attack response training. So that is fake blood <laughs> all over the snow. I had the fun job of lying in the freezing cold uh, while conservation officers responded to a mauling as part of a scenario for that training. Um, I then took a job with Parks Canada and came down to uh, work in Waterton National Park as a resource management officer, which is uh, human wildlife conflict, um, dealing with bear issues and things like that. Um, but also I was a duty officer on the public safety team where again, I got more experience as a first responder and also more training in things like water rescue, search and rescue theory, and a whole bunch of first aid training too. So who's Adaptable Outdoors? Well, we are a federally registered charity, a volunteer led board of directors that offers uh, outdoor adventures for people of all ages living with disabilities. We are uh, peer led. So 66% of our board is made up of people with lived disability experience. So the, the people we serve are always uh, guiding um, how we work and what we do. Our vision is for outdoor recreation to be accessible to people of all abilities. Our mission is to provide opportunities for people living with disabilities to experience the benefits of outdoor recreation. We use a number of value statements to guide our work, uh, dignity and respect, environmental stewardship and leave no trace principles, collaboration, integrity, and empathy and understanding. Now, the benefits of outdoor recreation and time spent in nature are very well documented. Um, people with disabilities may face varied and unique barriers to being able to access the outdoors or access certain uh, activities. And um, there's been many, many different studies which have highlighted the impact that um, adapted sports can have uh, for people living with a variety of different disabilities, uh, like the one that's on the screen right now. Um, but for me, it really hit home the importance of adaptive sport. When I had been out skiing with a friend of mine, I was volunteering for a, a winter sports organization uh, similar to us. And at the end of the day, um, I, my friend Kevin had had a great day, put in some great runs. And he turned to me and said, thanks so much for your help today. And I very foolishly and nonchalantly said, oh, it was nothing. And Kevin quickly corrected me and yelled, no, it was everything. And that's when it really hit home to me what those experiences meant to Kevin. Um, and then I asked Kev, hey, what do, you, what do you do in the summer? You know, you get out skiing in the winter. What do you do in summer? And Kev told me that he counted down the days till winter to when he could ski again because there were no summer programs for him to take part in. And that made me pretty sad. So uh, on the drive home, actually, from that day, I was asking my wife, Sarah, if I could uh, maybe find a piece of equipment to borrow from someone to get Kev up to the top of a mountain in summer so he could uh, experience that. And then crazily through talking about it to some people in the community, I found that Pinch Creek Library had a trail rider 
which is a $9,000 piece of adaptive equipment sitting in the library that you can check out with a library card, which, which at first I did not believe. <laughs> I thought it can't be that piece of equipment. I'll have to go and have a look. So I came down here and sure enough, the equipment was there. I gave him my $9 library card and checked it out. Felt like I was stealing something. <laughs> um, and it's a piece of equipment that Alberta Parks very graciously purchased and put it in the library here so that people can use it to get out on the trails in our park. So an amazing uh, thing uh, to have in our community. Um, and that uh, meant that I didn't have to borrow one from someone far away. I could just come down to the library, got some volunteers together, got Kevin out um, on his first hike in 18 years. And it, within that first five minutes, Kevin turned to me and said, I've just realized I've not been on a trail in a forest like this for 18 years. And then, you know, seeing the joy that that gave Kev and Kev was talking about friends of his that could also really uh, benefit from that experience to improve the mental health. Um, so I figured I'd ask around, see if I could recruit volunteers to help us get it going and uh, also see if I could find funding to be able to buy the uh, really expensive adaptive equipment we needed to be able to get people out. So um, that's kind of how Adaptable Outdoors was born and how I kind of started in this career. So we've worked very hard as an organization over the years to secure the foot to research, source, and find the funding to purchase an array of different adaptive equipment so we can meet uh, a variety of different needs. So just to give you an idea on what this kind of, this uh, equipment kind of costs, this is the trail rider. So that costs nine thousand dollars. The all-terrain buggy at the back with the headrest and other adaptations is nine and a half thousand dollars. Uh, the canoe, um, which was we got a really good deal on the canoe because uh, Joe Cunningham built it for us. Um, but even that came to, with all the adaptations that we've had to add to it over the years, uh, probably four and a half thousand dollars. So this uh, equipment can be prohibitively, prohibitively expensive for people to purchase them themselves, especially when you think that um, some wheelchairs now can cost twenty thousand dollars. So one of the great services that we provide is people can come out, try a piece of equipment, and see if it works for them without having to first drop $9,000 just to be able to give it a go. Um, so the, the adaptive equipment can really open up um, a new world for people. So in order to run our paddling program, we have a bunch, we have a whole fleet of boats now um, with different adaptations to help people get out on the water. Um, we have outriggers attached to the boats, which give incredible stability. Um, and make it very difficult to tip or flip the boat. Uh, we also add uh, lateral support seating systems, which allow uh, people to stay in place in the boat, and being able to tip the boat, or if it's somebody who has a natural lean, it holds them central. Um, we also have bricking aids to help people hold the paddle, and uh, paddle stands, uh, it's called a paddle pivot. So somebody doesn't even need to support the weight of the paddle, they can just do the movement and this stand holds the weight of the paddle for them. Uh, then we have our all-terrain buggy, which is great for kind of flat um, and slightly undulating trails, but nothing too steep. Uh, but it's a fantastic piece of equipment for accessing shore fishing spots because it's a um, beach wheel. So it can go in soft sand um, on riverbeds, no problem whatsoever. And it's also waterproof and floats. So we use it after paddle programs to give people a chance to swim in a mountain lake because some people may have never had that chance to in life. And it's, as we all know, an amazing invigorating feeling that everyone's experienced. So after paddling, we give people the option if they want to go in. Um, take them down the boat launch, as we can see uh, one of our clients at the top there have, having a ball and doing so. Um, and the 
piece of equipment will float in the water. We can take the person out. We can help them swim around, explore a bit, and bring them back into the into the uh, buggy and take them back up the boat launch. So really cool piece of equipment that adds a lot of fun to our programs. Uh, we also have two trail riders. Uh, we have one, the one we borrowed from Alberta Parks in the library. And we also have one that we purchased ourselves through a grant from the Lethbridge Fork Council. And this piece of equipment is designed to do high elevation hikes, moderate terrain, um, with the right team and expertise, it's amazing where you can go with this piece of equipment. Um, there is some terrain that you should avoid, <laughs> for sure, uh, but it is quite amazing the places that you can take people where otherwise they may not be able to access. And uh, typically we have two people on the trail ride and one on the back, but if we're going up steep terrain, we'll set up a rope system and have five or six volunteers all pulling and sharing the load. Um, so yeah, a great, another great piece of equipment. We also have uh, adaptive fishing equipment. We have, again, gripping aids to help people hold the rod, rod holders, so they don't have to hold the rod. And then we also have an electric fishing rod, uh, which uh, can be operated um, by the push of a button, stomp of the foot, flick of the head, or even suck and puff on a straw. So um, we bought a bunch of different switches that we can add to this rod so that we can meet a variety of different people's needs. We also have our special adaptive fishing canoe, the one I mentioned earlier that was built by the amazing Joe Cunningham. Uh, Joe was building these boats as a single person fly fishing boat with one set of outriggers. And I went to Joe and said, hey, could you build me something similar but as a two-person where we can be facing the client at all times and where we can install our lateral support seat, second set of outriggers so that we can get up and move around the boat and help and assist people as needed, and uh, also set up for fishing. So we have an anchor off each end. We have a, a fishing rod holder that we've added now here so the person can sit back, see the rod as we're trolling, and then use whatever switch works for them to reel in a fish if they get a bite. So this boat was designed and developed so that we could offer our kayak fishing programs to people of all abilities, different needs. Uh, it's really well set up for people with complex needs um, and we've improved it and uh, added things as we've gone and as we've learned other people's needs. We've also, uh, so, Two of the programs we've developed, um, as far as I know, nobody else does them in Alberta, and I don't think anybody else does them in Canada. I could be wrong with that, um, but as far as I know, nobody has developed adaptive kayak fishing programs for people of all different needs. Um, and then we've also, just last year, started to develop a kayak sailing program, um, and this were, these pictures here were from an experience we did that Travel Alberta filmed in Parks Canada to highlight the different options of uh, accessible activities that are available to people who want a holiday in Alberta who might be living with a disability. Uh, so this was an experience we did on Cameron Lake with uh, Christy, who is a retired Team Canada sledge hockey player, and Ryan Straczynski, who's the founder of the Straz Strong Foundation, and one of the survivors of the Humboldt bus crash. Um, so we got out on the lake, um, it was a beautiful day, a little bit of wind so that we could try out the sail and see how it was. And also both these guys caught a fish, so that really capped off the experience. So in addition to all the safety, all the uh, boat and equipment, uh, adapted equipment, we have to carry a lot of safety equipment too life jackets, throw ropes, in-reach devices, first aid kits. We also have to hold uh, certifications in wilderness first aid, paddle instruction courses. And we also have developed our own in-house training, which is specifically tailored to how you would rescue um, people with all different kinds of disabilities in the event of a, a kayak tipping over. 
So we've developed that training. We're going to be working with another adaptive sports organization this year to develop it further uh, because there's no actual certification out there for that. Uh, the paddle courses that you can go out and do don't teach you anything about that kind of stuff. Um, um, so it's something that we've learned from other adaptive sports agencies, one in Kelowna called Chris, who do an amazing course uh, on that. We've taken a bunch of their training and we've added some stuff in of our own that's more suited to our equipment because we have different equipment. And we're going to be uh, yeah, working with those guys to develop that training going forward. We also need lots of uh, uh, adaptations for comfort uh, because, um, you know, if somebody's going to be sat in a piece of equipment, a boat or a trail rider for between three and five hours, they could get pressure sores, they could get very uncomfortable. So we've been buying uh, cushions and different equipment that will mold to the person's body and improve uh, the chances of them staying comfortable for that length of time. So for kayaking, we have this cushion called Sweet Cheeks. <laughs> and then we also have um, a couple of Rojo cushions that we use on the trail riders. Now, even a, some of the wheelchair cushions, they can cost $600,000. So even, even for a cushion, it can be very expensive. We also uh, have to adapt equipment for people's needs. So this is, I think, this is Wayne on his first ever hike. And uh, Wayne um, holds his arms in a particular way and will push his elbows down. And here on this piece of equipment, there are sharp pieces there that would put into his elbows if we just took him out as is. Uh, so we, my wife and I are always going around thrift stores looking for odd pieces of foam that we can cut up and uh, put plastic over and waterproof uh, and then add to parts of our equipment to, uh, to help with comfort. We also had to add the cushion up here uh, because Dwayne requires some head and neck support and the trail rider doesn't really provide any. So little simple adaptations can make a big, big difference to someone. And um, sometimes trying to adapt an activity for absolutely everybody, all different needs, it's very difficult. It takes a lot of research, a lot of ingenuity um, and um, I wanted to give a couple of examples of how we've kind of figured things out to meet uh, the complex, uh, meet clients' needs who may be complex. So uh, this, in this example, the switch at the top, that is the switch that comes with the electric fishing rod. It's very small, requires fine motor skills to be able to press. Um, and we had some clients who we thought would benefit from a better switch that would be easier for them to operate. So we found this switch, which is called the ultimate switch. And uh, this was particularly with Dwayne in mind because Dwayne liked to fish and wanted to be able to independently reel in uh, the line. Um, so Dwayne communicates with his head. So I figured, well, he'd be able to use a head switch. So let's get one and try it out. Uh, the other thing, for Dwayne was he really wanted to get in a boat. He'd never been in a canoe or a kayak out on a lake before. Um, and that was also a little challenging for us in our first year. And the reason that was is because the seat that we can purchase, um, the lateral support seating system, this may look like a headrest, but it's actually a second backrest. And it comes at the upper part of your back. And Dwayne, somebody who requires head and neck support, so we couldn't get him out the first year. And I had to kind of try and figure out, well, how can we adapt this seat? So I took a look at Dwayne's wheelchair and noticed, oh, okay, it's just a bracket attached to the back of his seat with a bar that goes in and then a tension knob. Uh, so you can change the height of the headrest. So I was like, okay, well, that should be easy enough. I got a bracket. I got a wheelchair headrest. I went to Boulder Metal in Pinch Creek told them what I needed it for, what load it needed to take, and they were able to attach it in a in a much more secure way than they're even attached to wheel. So um, thanks to the adaptation on the fishing rod and the adaptation on our seat, this uh, was Dwayne getting out in a canoe for the first time um, and also operating the fishing, fishing rod for the first time.
So hopefully this video works. Sometimes it does not, so we'll see. That's Dwayne's ex uh, excited guys. And you can see here we're trolling and Dwayne is just trying out the rod, getting used to how it works. You can see the reel is going. That's from Dwayne moving his head to, head to the side on that switch there. You can also see the headrest there giving him head and neck support. So that equipment was developed with Dwayne in mind, but thanks to that development, I think it was four other people with similar needs to Dwayne also got out on their first ever boating experience that year and more since in the following years. Now, uh, I just want to talk about the cost of developing new accessible activities. It's very, very expensive. So for example, if we want to, um, continue to develop the kayak sailing program. This is the best piece of equipment out there. Um, this allows the, the client to control the sail and the rudder using a joystick and even sip and puff switches. But this piece of equipment is $13,000. Then we would need another trailer to be able to transport it uh, because you need a specialized trailer, which would be $4,000. Then you have the increase in insurance then you have um, the need for more staff to operate that alongside our other programs. Then you also have to market the program, <laughs> promote it, get it out there, let people know it's available. So the estimate to get this piece, the other big thing is it's quite a complex piece of equipment. So me and my staff would either have to go down to Utah and get trained by the University of Utah to develop this uh, on how to use it or we'd have to pay for them to come up here and train us. So I did my estimate. It's between eighty dollars and $100,000 for us to develop that program further. Um, and then we've looked into biking programs in the past. Um, we don't want to develop an activity if we can't offer it to everybody. So we have to get equipment that can meet the highest level of needs. And this bike here is one of those pieces of equipment for biking. That costs between twenty and twenty-six thousand dollars, depending on what adaptations you get on there. And you can't just have one because you can't keep up with it on a regular bike. It's full throttle electric uh, bike, so you need to have two of those. So you can have a guide keep up with the client, the training course uh, to instruct people in that. I don't remember exactly, but it's close to a thousand dollars per staff member. Um, so with the biking, even for us to just get started, you'd be looking at somewhere between 120 and $150,000. So that just, you know, it's just to, you know, people sometimes say, oh, how come you guys don't do this? Or how come you guys don't do that? And it's basically down to resources. Um, the resources it takes and the time to develop different activities is quite considerable. And for us, we've, done a pretty good job in, in a very short space of time. We've developed five different activities now. Hiking, paddling, shore fishing, kayak fishing, and we're just getting going with the kayak sailing. Um, so to develop five in a short space of time, I think, uh, I think we're doing okay. <laughs> um, before we take people out, we also have to do detailed assessments of our clients' needs so that we have some idea what equipment is gonna work for them, and also, um, you know, what is their goal? What do they want to get out of coming on a program with us? Because different people have different um, different goals and different things that they want to achieve by coming out and recreating with us. Uh, now, in the backcountry, there's no mechanical lifts, so we do all of our transfers manually. And we have to train our staff in how to safely transport people in. Um, on an uneven ground <laughs> in uh, you know, a situation and environment very different to like a healthcare setting. So we have to transfer in slightly different ways sometimes. And we have some equipment that helps with that, like slings and uh, brute strength. <laughs> but um, yeah, the transfers um, is something that you need to know how to do and you need to be able to offer if you're gonna offer these programs to everybody.
We also have a bunch of techniques and different learning styles that we use for our clients who are living with cognitive or behavioral challenges. Um, so we may, you know, get hands on and actually show them the movement to, so that they gain that muscle memory of how paddling works. Or I may say, okay, copy exactly what I'm doing and get them to copy my strokes. That way I can do, just paddle on the left and get them to copy me and say, see, we're turning right now. And I can teach them about how to control the kayak properly. There's some people who may um, struggle with certain teaching methods. We come up with different ideas. So for example, um, we have some kids who don't know the left from the right and I'm yelling left, left. <laughs> that, that's not gonna work very well, is it? So I put different colored stickers on the end of the panel. So, in, and I check they know what the color is. And then I say, okay, red, red, red. And they will just paddle on the side with a red sticker. So there's lots of different techniques we try and use to, to help people learn and develop skills. We also are very aware that a lot of our clients may be dealing with trauma, whether that be trauma from an injury or an illness that has resulted in their disability, or whether it's just the daily trauma of living in a world that isn't built for you and should be. Um, so we're very cognizant of that, and we try to be very aware that um, sometimes being out and doing an activity that you used to love and you thought maybe you couldn't do again, and now you're getting out to try it, can be quite profound on people and uh, sometimes you need to give people a minute to take it in and uh, give them some space. We also work from a client-centered care uh, approach so as I spoke about earlier people have different goals for some people it might be a destination. I want to go to the top of this mountain that I used to go to as a kid and I thought I could never go back to. Well um, that's your goal will get you to that destination. Um, for some people, it's about skill development. Want to learn how to paddle a kayak independently. Okay, great. Come out with us over a few weeks and we'll develop those skills and uh, try and get you uh, as much independence as possible in the kayak. For others, it might be about exercise. They want to get out and they want to get some exercise. Again, our programs can provide that. For other people, it could just be time in nature and social interaction. So we find that a lot for our shore fishing programs that we do for people from assisted living facilities. It's not about catching a fish. It's about sitting at the lake with your buddies, having a chat, telling stories, um, and listening to the birds sing. So over the years, we've helped people with a variety of different abilities. Um, this is just a short list of some of the conditions the people who participate with us live with. Um, and our age range so far for clients has been between five and 96 years of age, um, which is quite an incredible age range, really. Uh, so for this client, she wanted to develop her skills in a boat, uh, in a kayak. She's never been in a kayak before. She started out in a tandem kayak with outriggers, with one of our staff as a guide, we then progressed to a single kayak with outriggers. By the afternoon, we took the outriggers off because she was doing so well. And then we also taught her how to paddle different kayaks, even pedal-driven kayaks, and then also paddleboard. Uh, I'm told she now owns her own paddleboard, creating with family and friends independently of our organization. That was achieved just over three or four weeks, three or four weeks. Um, that little bit of skill development we did with her has now opened up a whole world of opportunities for her and her family. This is another one of our clients, Christina, um, who was in her 30s before ever getting to try an adaptive sport, which to me is a crime. Uh, everyone should get to try kayaking or swim in a mountain lake or get on a, a trail. Um, and Christina came out, absolutely loved her first experience, and over the years has come out every year hiking, kayaking, um, and sometimes going for a swim too. Um, and this is what Christina had to say about what our programs meant to her. Dreams have now become reality 
thanks to the dedicated staff and volunteers within this wonderful organization. They go above and beyond to make each experience as rich, memorable, and fulfilling as possible, while approaching the task with humor and the utmost care. Adaptable Outdoors and its programming has freed me from, my, from the confines of my disability, empowering me to feel that endless opportunities are within my reach. Now, not every client can provide a written testimonial, but the smile on these guys' faces and the laughter that was heard on the lake that day, I think, says it all about what they thought about our programs. Um, I spoke about um, how our programs impact clients and can also impact family members and caregivers. They also impact our volunteers, the people who come out and help uh, deliver our programs. And this is what one student volunteer had to say after volunteering with us. As a volunteer, the connection provides for a great sense of community, which benefits everyone involved. While volunteering with Adaptable, I've learned the value of the outdoors, the importance of irrepressible optimism, and what it means to be part of something truly exceptional. So during the summer months, May until mid-September, we run uh, all different programs for children, youth, and adults living with physical or cognitive disabilities. Um, in the middle picture there, you can see somebody else benefiting from the headrest that we fitted to our canoe. Um, here we've got uh, Manuel, uh, who's using the paddle pivot um, to help with his paddling. And also, so he can let go of his paddle and squirt people with his water pistol that's on his lap, including me. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, at the bottom here, we have a mother who came out multiple times last year, all the way from Medicine Hall, um, to try kayaking. Came once and came two or three more times after that. She, she and her son enjoyed it so much. Um, and the top right is Becca Niels, who's one of our board members. She had an idea for a fundraiser one year. She'd always wanted to see what the falls at Lundbrook look like from below. She'd, she'd for years always gone there and looked at them from the top. She wanted to see the view from below. And Becca is somebody who lives with cerebral palsy and was told when she was younger she would never walk. But Becca, is a tough lady <laughs> and uh, she trains and trains so that she can walk short distances on her crutches and she trained for months i think so that she could walk down the steps with our uh, you know support and uh see the falls from a different angle um, and then we helped her back up with the trail rider but she did all is it it was, it was something like 70 or 80 steps that she walked down. Uh, we counted them. And in the process, she raised $3,000 for our organization. So uh, amazing work from Becca. Uh, on, in the bottom corner here, we have a whole family unit, um, a young girl, her parents and her grandparents all on a trip to Bertha Falls in the trail rider. Now, um, in addition to our programs for children, youth, and adults, we also run programs for seniors. Um, when I looked at our statistics after the first couple of years, I realized that we were helping very few seniors. And that was despite the fact that we are in an aging community whose national, whose age is higher than the average national age. So um, it, meant for some reason we weren't reaching some of the people who were seniors who may have mobility or cognitive challenges. And we also realized that during COVID, they were some of the people who were most affected. They were increasingly isolated within their own homes or within the care homes in which they lived. So I made a decision that we would uh, really make a big effort to try and expand our programs to get more seniors out. And I did that by changing the language we use, uh, creating um, promotional material that was specifically targeted at, at seniors and also partnering with assisted living facilities and H, uh, AHS rec therapy department to get people out of the care homes. We've been trapped there for uh, some people over two and a half years. And it, it was very rewarding to be able to give pe some of those people their first trip out in that length of time. So, uh, here we have uh, people from Vista Village in Pinch Creek getting out 
Uh, we have Lois here, who is here today, getting out for a hike in Waterton. Um, and we have someone from one of the care homes in um, Lethbridge, enjoying some shore fishing. And then here we have a lady who learned to kayak for the first time in the reef and loved it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we have another one uh, Jam. Now, uh, in addition to the different clients that we have that we support, we also uh, support and are supported by many family members of people living with disabilities. And we really couldn't do our programs without their help and uh, support. So I want to say a big, big thank you to all the family members and caregivers that have made our programs possible. So in the top here, we have a grandma who wanted her grandson to see this special view. Here we have the family from the slide before, that's granddad taking a selfie with uh, his granddaughter at Bertha Falls. Here we have um, uh, the day out with Vista Village paddling. There's Mel, uh, really giving us a lot of help that day and also making sure uh, it was a really fun time too, so big thanks to Mel. And then uh, this is a, a, a mother and daughter from Pinch Creek getting out to kayak together for the first time. And finally, a school group who wanted to get their friend up to the top of Tiny Point. So those kids actually were the ones who pushed and pulled the trail line up. And they were all pushing and pulling to get their friend up in the view. So uh, we keep detailed statistics of what we do each year. In 2023 alone, we uh, had 100 clients with disabilities programs. We had 81 different family members or caregivers take part, uh, which meant we impacted 181 people. We also delivered multiple experiences with clients. So in total, we delivered 228 outdoor recreation experiences in 2023 alone and 37 amazing generous help us do that because we have a very small uh, team uh, me and so without the help and support of the community there's no way we can hit those numbers so this has been our increase uh, over the last three years in client uh, number of clients and experiences delivered as you can see, each year, demand is growing. Um, and in order to keep up with the demand, we need to diversify our funding sources because you never know when a government grant may disappear. So we've been trying to find more corporate sponsors um, and more ways to raise funds um, so that we can continue to offer these programs at low cost or for free to those who are experiencing financial hardship. Um, because, yeah, with free staff, we can't keep growing the way that we are. So we're really on the lookout for more partners who care about accessible and equitable access. This is how our senior experiences have increased over the years. Seniors went from being our lowest demographic that, that came out on our programs to now being behind. So from just we uh, are now gave 91 senior experiences, 45 um, And we've been started work last year to increase the number of children and youth because since we've picked up the senior numbers, those are now our lowest demographic. So last year we did a bit of a push to try and get more children and youth involved. And again, saw a big increase in both the number of clients that came out and the number of experiences we delivered. That was uh, very much thanks to a partnership with Bridges Consulting. I want to say a big thanks to them and their care caregivers for all their help during those programs. Um, I'm happy to announce today for the first time that um, we're going to be working to increase our impact on children and youth this year with the support of the Calgary Flames, who are covering registration fees 
for all children and youth for our programs this year. So I'm happy to announce that um, any experience that somebody 21 or under would like to take part in this year will be offered for free by our organization, thanks to the Calgary Flames. So uh, big thanks to them. They're also supporting us with uh, equipment uh, that's specifically tailored for children. So uh, yeah, big thanks to the Calgary Flames for the support. We have uh, conducted research on the impact of our programs. Um, so we did a, a research project in partnership with the University of Lethbridge to measure how our programs impact health, quality of life and well-being. Um, and that was the research question. We'll engage in, in just one experience, increase health, quality of life and well-being for clients and family members and caregivers and volunteers. I wanted to survey everybody who comes and participates to see if there was an impact and if so, what it was. So we surveyed clients, family members and caregivers and volunteers. And the preliminary findings showed that yes, engaging in just one experience with our organization can improve health quality of life, and well-being for clients, volunteers and family members and caregivers. In fact, the study found that even half a day uh, spent in the outdoors on one of our programs led to a huge improvements in social, emotional well-being and self-confidence self -confidence and renewed life interest. We've been very thankful to be uh, recognized for the work that we've done over the years with uh, a few awards. In 2021, we were, we were given the Community Partnership Award by the Alberta Therapeutic Recreation Association, who are the governing body for uh, therapeutic recreation professionals here in Alberta. We were also awarded the Collaborator Award by the International Day of Persons with Disabilities Committee in Lethbridge last year. And we were also awarded last year the Community Organization Impact Award at the Pinch Creek Chamber of Commerce Awards of Excellence. I got that right. <laughs> Um, so we have a lot of volunteer opportunities. If anybody wants to get involved, we uh, recruit volunteers who have experience with hiking, paddling or fishing, but also people can contribute in a number of different ways, even outside of the program. So we're looking for people to help with fundraising, admin, outreach, um, all different aspects. There is some way that you could contribute. Um, and we're also trying to recruit more seniors to be volunteers and help support our senior programs. So if you are a senior or know of any seniors that may be interested, please get in touch. Uh, we also have a fundraiser, an online peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser that we started last year and that we're gonna run every year. Basically, you can set yourself any kind of physical challenge. Uh, can be absolutely anything from, I wanna swim this many lengths in the pool every week, it could be, I want to wheel around in my wheelchair around my block six times uh, in a row um, each week, which one client did last year. Um, or it could be, I want to hike the free peaks or I want to run a marathon. It's a challenge that you come up with yourself that is designed to meet your needs and your abilities um, and anyone can get involved. So if you're interested in that, that will open up again. Uh, in April or June, uh, sorry, May or June. And yeah, you set yourself a challenge and then ask friends and family to sponsor you as you complete that challenge. Uh, it's supposed to try and get people outside being active while also raising money for a good cause. Just want to finish up by saying a huge, huge thank you to all our funders and supporters. These are our organizations that funded us last year with a few that have stepped up to fund us this year as well. Um, and we really couldn't do any of our programs without these funding supports and these corporate sponsors. So big, big thank you to all those organizations for um, yeah, helping us achieve what we can. So um, these are my contact details. If anybody would like to get in touch, if you're interested in volunteering, if you have any questions, if you'd like to learn more about us, you can also go to our website at adaptableoutdoors.ca. Uh, or you can also watch, there's a short movie uh, that features our organization 
on YouTube called All Among the Bison. So finally, I'd just say big thanks to everyone for coming today and listening to the talk. And I'll now happily answer any questions you may have. Okay. Anybody here have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So a half day hike, tiny point, be $25. For shore fishing, it's $15. Uh, for a full day hike or a full day of paddling, it's $50. Um, but if it's a half day, then it's 25. And if somebody is experiencing financial hardship, we will pay for things. Well, yeah, and that's because when I did a lot of research into this, I found that people living with dis disabilities are disproportionately represented under the national poverty line. And it's because H has been removed from the inflation index, which was a travesty um, and equipment is so expensive. Uh, if you have to buy a wheelchair and it can cost $20,000. A vehicle, an accessible vehicle can be an incredible amount of money and can be very difficult to get the funding for. So uh, we operate on a principle of um, when people register, we explain why we have that pricing model. And then we say, we ask that those who can afford to pay more please donate in addition to your registration fee. And we have found that we take in more money from registration fees from that system than if we charged everybody the same amount. Um, because the people who can afford it will pay more for those experiences, we find. But yet you don't price out the people who are struggling financially and could really benefit from these experiences. Yeah. No, no. Yes. So grant money, but most of my wage doesn't come from grant money, um, but it could be grant money, it could be corporate sponsorships, um, it could be fundraisers that we do ourselves uh, for my wages and for my staff's wages, because you know we can buy all the expensive equipment in the world, but if there's not well-trained people there to operate the equipment, then it's no good to anybody. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, well, us. Um, so I'm the executive director. So I run the day-to-day -day management with the uh, board of director oversight. Anybody can ask anybody, uh, can ask any charity or nonprofit to see their books. And I'll quite happily show anybody our books talk through every single thing that we spend. And what you'll find is that actually there's much money we don't spend because I've donated things, for example. For example, we can't afford a vehicle to pull our trailer. I use my own personal vehicle to do that at cost to myself. Um, and that's been the case since we started. When we first started, it was just before COVID hit. There was literally no funding out there. So I worked for two and a half years for free to get this thing off the ground and get it going. Yeah. Well, yeah, but does that not drive the demand? And is the drive, is the demand not obvious from the numbers we just showed you? <laughs> yeah, of course you have to do outreach to reach more people, but because if people don't know about it, how can they access your services? But at the end of the day, as more and more people learn about us or hear about the services, demand increases. And we have to try and meet that demand or we have to turn people away or we have to increase our prices. And then all of a sudden, like I say, suddenly uh, we're pricing out a lot of people that could really benefit from our services. So yeah, does that answer your question?
for sure. Yeah. Unless we get more stuff. <laughs> well, I've doubled my workforce this year from last year and the previous years. And we've had our biggest year of delivering experiences last year and also our biggest year ever for fundraising. So I would have to respectfully say you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. 22 and one for 22. Yeah, and we can see two examples of organizations that have gone for 12 years and 22 years, and they continue to grow every year. So the examples are there. Yeah. 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 And the impact is huge. So we just need the community support to continue to, to do what we do. Any other questions? Lois? No. That's CADS. So that's, uh, yeah, that's CADs who do the downhill skiing. Uh, we are summer programs. Um, and you'll find a lot of organizations that do what we do. They only operate one season or they may only do one activity because of the huge amount of cost for the equipment, the insurance, the time to recruit volunteers, train volunteers, train staff. So there are many organizations that say just do skiing or just do uh, horses. Uh, and oh, there's other organizations, for example, that just target a specific user group and they're all doing amazing work, but it's because it's so time consuming and expensive to try and adapt to these activities that there's only so much you can do, um, unless you have a huge team of staff. So going out of Canmore, they do a ton of different activities, but they contract other organizations to do some of those activities like adaptive yoga, for example. Um, and then they also have a, a huge team of staff that they've been able to get funded. Um, they come from a community of 12,000 people. We're in a community of 4,000. They uh, closest city has well over a million people. Our closest city has over 100,000 people. So we're drawing from a much smaller uh, set of resources, that's for sure. But we've had great success with grants. Um, like I say, we've successfully developed five different activities that were not available to people before we began. It is working. The evidence is right there. Come out and see a program. See it firsthand. Yeah. Okay, thanks for your time. And if you do want to get in contact with him and you missed his slide at the end, don't hesitate to call the library and I will pass on his information for you. Um, this presentation will also be on the Chinook Arch YouTube page, hopefully in a week. And we will provide the link on the library Facebook page and a website when it is available. So you can share it with all that you know who might have been interested in this presentation. Um, Lindsay says, thank you so much, Steve. You can really see the passion you have for helping people achieve their goals and participate in these amazing outdoor opportunities. And I do have to say, as a person with disabilities, my disabilities have not impeded my ability to like 
go and enjoy the outdoors, but I really appreciate people who are um, able-bodied who see how hard life is for those of us who do struggle and it it makes a difference. So thank you. Okay, thank you everybody for tuning in and hopefully we will see you next time at on Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Bye-bye. Have a great night.